Welcome, everyone. I'm Lee Schneider, Communications Director of Red Cup Agency, and this is Genius Lunch. It's a free webinar for startups. Today's topic is how startups can create a dream team. Let's see if I can switch the slide. There we go. Great. So joining me today, we have some special guests, and we have also Natalie Campisi, our webinar producer. Hi, Natalie. How are you doing today? Great, great. How are you guys doing? Very good. So let's uh, introduce our guests and get right into this. This is a pretty fast-paced 30 minutes, so we will pack a lot in here. I just want to do a quick introduction to our guests, and then Natalie's going to ask the questions. Uh, we're really happy to present two guests today. First, Dean Hume, author of the book, Building Great Startup Teams, a guide to attracting, hiring, and retaining employees. And Dean is joining us from London. Welcome, Dean. Hi there. Thank you. Okay. And then on chat today, we have Judy Vincent. Uh, she's on chat. She's a recruiter and talent strategist in New York. And she's going to be offering her insights today via chat. So, the way that works is there is a chat window, right? It's kind of in the middle of your screen. And if you chat in your questions to anyone here, we will keep track of them and answer them toward the end of things. We'll leave some room to, uh, to answer all questions. If you don't want to have that chat window in, there's a button with a couple of arrows on it, sort of in the upper middle of your screen called full. And that's going to make the screen go full if you prefer that way. So let's just do a quick overview of what we're going to cover in 30 minutes. Here's a quick overview of all our topics. We want to know where we should be looking for great talent. Do we go to job sites, LinkedIn, where? And also, what kinds of things should we be asking in interviews? Uh, Dean will talk about that a bit, and you can chat to Judy, and she'll answer those questions, too. Benefits are a biggie. We'll cover those. And this is really important, kind of a soft target, but people don't think about this enough, I think. How to create a culture that attracts the kind of talent that you're looking for. And finally, how not just to keep but strengthen your team. So Natalie's going to ask all the questions. I might jump in. And again, you can, too, by chatting in your questions in the chat window. We'll leave time at the end. So, Natalie, here we go. Okay, great. Um, uh, Dina, well, um, let me ask you this question. Um, as far as looking for new talent, um, where should new, you know, where should companies start, especially startups? Uh, some of the obvious places are uh, websites like Indeed or AngelList for startups. But and if you have a bigger budget, um, and Judy can speak to this too, you know, hiring a recruiting firm or an executive search firm. But are there other places? Um, what, what we're seeing is that a lot of um, recruiters are using social media for, or a lot of startups and, and companies are using sh social media for recruiting. So, so what do you feel about that? Um, all right, I'll jump straight in there. Um, okay. the, I think you need to try as many avenues as possible. Uh, and one, one of the things that I always like, like thinking, the way I like thinking about uh, ca finding candidates and finding great people is that, you almost need to treat them like you would a customer if you were about to sell to them. If you were about to sell your product to a customer and it was online, you, you know, you'd try social media, um, you would try offline techniques, you'd try things like events and fairs. Um, you'd also try your own network of friends and, and reach out through your own network and, and see who's available. Uh, you know, there's also, you know, using the obvious ones like the websites, the job sites that are out there um, that allow you to just uh, trawl through the links which is, you know, a great opportunity as well. Um, and, yeah, I think, you know, as you briefly mentioned, one of the things I also really like is is working either with internal recruiters, uh, recruiters if you're able to afford one in your own startup, uh, I think it can be very helpful, or uh, working with an external recruiter. Um, but, you know, there is there's pros and cons to working with external recruiters for sure. I don't know if we want to get into that just yet, but um, I think, you know, to answer that question, to summarize that question, I really think you should try every avenue possible, online and offline techniques, try your own friends and your own network that's already out there. You'll be surprised how many people you actually know. Great. And um, and Judy, you might be able to to kind of um, to help with this this question, too. It's you're, you're a recruiter, so you do this professionally. What are some of um, the things 
recruiters and executive search firms can offer that um, you know, looking for talent on your own can't. And what are the pros and cons? And also, uh, budget-wise, you know, what, um, how much should should companies expect to spend on something like that? Yeah, I I don't think her audio is working, but uh, she could uh, chat in the answer to that, uh, and uh, we'll read it out as she chats it in. Uh, I can see her saying she's been on both sides of the desk and she's chatting in her answer here. Okay, great. Thanks, Judy. I appreciate I appreciate doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, Dean, if you want to expound just a little bit on on the the recruiting side of it, that would be great. We'll just take maybe a minute or two to do that. Okay, great. I'll I'll do my best while uh, while Judy's busy mm -hmm. talking there. Um, okay. So believe it or not, I, I dedicated uh, an entire chapter of the book. To, to really just talking about working with uh, contractors and, and recruiters to help you find the right people. Um, I think, you know, speaking purely from a, a hiring manager's point of view and, you know, being on the other side, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Judy has her, her opinions on things too. Um, but you always have to, you always have to be very careful when you're a fledgling startup and, and you're, you know, money is tight and you're very constrained. It, it can be quite expensive, especially if you if you have a, a lot of hires to make. I think one of the things that, that I always like to do is plan, plan ahead. If you know you're going to be looking at four or five hires in the next X months, um, think about how you could approach that. If if you see yourself hiring constantly for the considerable future, uh, it might be worth considering actually getting your own internal recruiter. Um, and a lot of companies are starting to do that nowadays. Uh, they're getting uh, just an, a, a recruiter that reaches out on behalf of the company. It, be, it can be quite nice sometimes um, to receive that. You know, if you're a, if you're in a, uh, just someone out and you receive a LinkedIn message from an internal recruiter, it can it can be quite a nice thing and a bit of a personal touch. And sometimes the internal recruiters actually have. Uh, you know, a bit of an insight on on the culture of your company, and they understand how to how to really sell that and, and bring it across. It's almost it's not like someone who has no affiliation with your company is trying to sell you a role. Um, so they can really answer the questions and and um, some of the more direct things that that you that um, your, your potential candidates would need to find out. What and I want to jump in here. What Judy is uh, chatting in is very interesting. Is a lot of this depends on speed. Uh, you know, she's saying she's agreeing with Dean when you're talking, looking at multiple channels and niche websites. But if you have to fill open roles, partnering with an executive search firm is highly beneficial, she says, uh, depending on the budget and speed. And I just want to speak to that as a startup founder myself and both Natalie and I in the workspace we work in, it's filled with startups. The size of your organization matters a lot. And what I mean by that specifically is if the team is really small, every new addition really changes the team. You know, if you have three or four people and you add another, that's a big change. So you're really thinking carefully about each person. But as you grow, I could see where a recruiter would really be able to help you formulate a plan because you can't keep your mind on every single person that you're adding as you grow, if that makes sense. Uh, I want to move on to, uh, and Natalie, you can ask this question, this idea of the uh, the interview, you know, planning for an interview is kind of switching gears here, right? Because we're, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about being the hirer, but now you can fill me in, Natalie. Are we going to talk about here the, are we planning for the day of the interview from the interviewee's perspective or the interviewer or both? Uh, this is actually a, a, a Dean suggestion, so I'll, I'll um, I'll ask him, you know, kind of to, to sort of fill us in and, and what his thoughts are on this. And um, I'll 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 take it from there. <laughs> right, right. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So this was this was really just an area that I think uh, is so important, especially if you're a small startup um, and you're trying to compete with the with the you know larger, more established companies out there. When when a candidate comes to your office for the first time. It really, it really helps if you think about the day and you start planning for the day ahead. Um, you know, earlier on I mentioned treating the candidate as if they were a customer, as if you were trying to sell something to them. 
And and one of the parts of this is really just making sure you're ready for when they arrive. I've 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 been to many interviews myself where you know the hiring manager isn't on time or they're half an hour late or you know the people who are involved in the interview just don't show up and uh, the meeting room is a mess and you know all these sort of things. And I think some of the things that I like to do if you're planning for the day of the interview, try and make sure that you've you've blocked out uh, you know a few hours and the necessary time you need. And also sent out calendar invites to um, to the people who are going to be involved in the interviews with you. Um, in, in in our office, I know we, we, there's a constant contention for uh, meeting rooms, so I try and make sure that the meeting rooms are always booked out and that they're you know disturbance free, so we don't have anyone walking in and walking out. Um, and and really just just making sure that the candidate feels like you've got a polished professional approach from the minute they walk in your door. Uh, to the minute they really step out, it can make such a difference uh, from from the candidate side and, and can impress them. It makes sense too in the sort of moving parts of this, just to get the calendar invites right and things like that. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question of Dean right about FaceTime. How important is that? And I ask that as someone I've hired people completely remotely. I've hired people I've never met. And, but I've lately been insisting that people come in and I meet them and talk to them, at least have an initial interview. Do you think that that's a, a super value or optional or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, definitely. Um, I, and I think this is all down to, you know, prior experiences and I kind of can't speak for everyone, but, uh, I really like that social connection and that, and that the personal touch that you sometimes can't really get over, a, over a Skype. I do think, it can be very helpful to have the initial conversation, uh, but you know, bringing someone into the office uh, and getting to meet the rest of the team, just having a walk around and, and, and seeing things is, I think, is quite an important part of the whole process. And you know, not only to mention that, I think getting as many people involved as possible in the interview. I, I try and aim for at least three or more people, not necessarily all in the same room at once, uh, but. Allowing the candidate to meet a few people instead of just one person at a time, uh, it gives you a more well-rounded uh, well opinion on the candidate, and it gives them a good chance to understand what you are really about. Interesting. Yeah, and Judy is chatting in, you know, when you're a nascent firm with relatively low brand equity, in other words, not a lot of people know who you are, that candidate experience becomes all the more critical. I really believe in that, you know, the notion that no one, you're a startup, right? So not a lot of people know who you are. So bring on a few people, have a lot of conversations, and make that initial experience really complete. Uh, I think that's great. So, Natalie, I'm going to let you jump into this next one, since we, this is a good segue, asking the right questions. Right. This is, um, you know, this is uh, a big a big part of the interview process here. You You finally – have whittled down your your candidates to a few that that are going to come in and talk to you. So, um, how do you how do you formulate the right questions and what what should you ask and what things do people miss? And um, I'm sure Judy, you probably have a lot of insight into this, and, and Dean as well. So, um, Dean, if you want to go ahead and answer that first, and Judy can uh, text in her answer, type in her answer. All right, fantastic. Um, so. I think, you know, again, just before diving straight into some of the questions that I like to ask, I think, again, planning for the day is, is, is an important part. And, and not only just planning, kind of formulating a list of questions and common questions that you have and getting those lined up and ready can really be helpful, you know, for both you as a hiring manager and the other people that are the interviewers who are involved. Uh, some of the questions that, that I find very useful uh, are actually finding out why the person left their last role. Uh, and, and digging a little bit deeper into that, you know, sometimes you'll find out that someone will just say, you know, I left my last role because uh, I was I moved city or, uh, you know, I was looking for something more. And, and that's totally cool. But sometimes you might dig a little bit deeper under the surface and you actually find this uh, a little bit more information that could actually be helpful to you. And you might <laughs> sway your decision depending on if this person's right or not for you. I, I also like to ask the person, what their ideal culture is, really. What, what sort of office environment are they looking for? Uh, and based on what they understand of your culture, do they feel like this is the right place for them? Uh, it can also help align 
your your ideas and, and, and make sure that they're on the same page as you. And another area, a question that um, I, I quite like to ask is, uh, what frustrates you? And people generally, it, it sounds like a loaded question, and it is a little bit of a loaded question, but people generally go straight into it and they... Um, and, and they'll tell you what frustrates them about their job. And it, became, and it can be quite useful to find out, you know, just to, to get the questions rolling and the balls rolling from there. Um, I have a few others lined up, but I don't know if there's any from Judy. Okay. If she wants to. Judy is texting in a couple of things, you know, asking, asking the candidates to cite examples from a past work experience because that's the way the person has behaved in a past job is an indicator of how they will perform in a future role. I agree with that, that's good. She also says, uh, I believe strongly that a competency behavioral-based interview is a great way to assess candidate skills. And maybe, uh, Judy, you could go into that a little bit more in a further text, but I can give you my version of that kind of one-line thing, which is I often will ask people uh, right up, uh, do you have any questions for me? Uh, and it tells me a lot about the candidate. Uh, people will say, no, I have no questions, which sort of suggests that they're not that eager or haven't, you know, they're not that curious. And other people will say, uh, oh, yes, I have a lot of questions. And they'll leap in and we'll get into a conversation right away. And that says to me, here's a more curious, exploratory type of person. Uh, Judy's also pointing out, ask questions using open words like how, uh, yeah. what and when, which is very smart. And don't ask the yes or no kind of question because that doesn't get you very much out of the person. Uh, that's good advice. I know that a lot from as being a journalist. Uh, when you, if you ask, you know, uh, were you, did you, uh, were you ever arrested? And they say, no, <laughs> you know, there's like, not much of an answer for you. Uh, but when were you arrested is a much better question. Just if I could jump in at one little point there, one of the one of the things I always find really experienced uh, interviewers do is they they almost give the candidate a little bit of time to answer the question too. Uh, instead of you know they'll they'll ask the question and and if the candidate doesn't answer the full question immediately, they you know give a little five whatever two three five second breather. Um, and you almost often find that once the candidate's a bit off the spot and they don't feel like they're rushed, they they kind of embellish a bit more. Um, and also find really smiling and, and, and nodding and agreeing with someone if, if you think that they're right, kind of really encourages them. Mm -hmm. uh, Judy's uh, typing in too that the format of the interview could be, depending on the length of the interview, is if you have a 45 minute interview, spend about five minutes introducing yourself, 30 to 35 minutes interviewing the candidate and leaving five minutes at the end for questions. I like that too, because often as a, employer, I spend a lot of time yakking in the interview when I should be listening. I should be doing more listening, really. I think it's probably more productive. Uh, you know, are there, are there a number of interviews that employers should have? Is one sufficient, or should you have a couple? And if, if so, then what should the follow-up interview be like, or what should that format be like? I know it varies. There are some employers that will call people back three and sometimes even four times to interview for the same position. And, Dean, you want to run with that? Yeah, yeah, cool. So I, I can only speak from my past experience, um, and, I'm, and I'm sure different companies this relates differently. Um, but one of the ways we like to do it is one interview day. So the you know the candidate is, is busy, and, and especially if you know the candidate's in high demand, we don't want to waste their time. So we try to do it over one day, um, and it doesn't take the entire day. Normally we have it split over three separate sections. So we'll have, you know, for example, we'll have what we call a soft skills interview, just to find out a bit about their past. If there's a technical side to their role, we'll do a technical interview, and then we'll just do a rounding up section. Um, and generally, this takes over an hour. We, we, we tend to range between two hours to two and a half hours. And it seems like quite a lot, but it really gives you a well-rounded view of the candidates. Um, mm -hmm. That's you know, you know uh, Greg is answered, and I wanted to angle your answer a little bit toward this. Greg is asking a really interesting question. Uh, what are the, your thoughts on finding a co-founder or CTO, COO? In other words, kind of a peer level interview. How does that change the process? All right, I'm, I'll, I'll jump in on this one again. Um, it, what I like to do is almost, if, if I'm hiring for someone that's an equivalent or a peer level role, 
I almost try and aim for uh, to rope friends in or someone that I know is of an equal level to myself to help me get a rounded opinion. Mm. I wouldn't like to just go in, you know, just myself as a solo. I, I try and get as many people that be working with this person in the role, especially coming in from other departments if possible. Uh, and also, I, I sometimes reach out externally to some of my friends, and when I say friends, I mean my, my work colleagues that I would have worked with previously in the past who are in roles that I'd be looking to hire for. Interesting. And I just want to read out Judy's uh, text here because it's interesting. She's saying, but with experienced hires, we usually do a first round with peer-level interviewers or slightly more senior, and then, depending on the feedback, we invite the candidate in to meet with the more senior in the next round. So it's still a process. But uh, I think it changes it a bit uh, because you really, it's a collegial hire and I, that's obviously different than someone who's working for you. Does that sum that up pretty well? Uh, any other thoughts on that topic? No, that sounds good to me. All right, so uh, Natalie, why don't you take this one? We're gonna get into uh, benefits. So yeah, so this is sort of a big question for a lot of startups. We're seeing all sorts of benefit packages out there, and um, of course, um, smaller startups or startups that are you know first round funding or something are trying to compete for the best talent. So, what sort of benefits package um, should startups offer? Uh, of course, you know take into consideration budget. Um, should there be a balance of maybe you know your more common uh, uh, benefits like a health insurance? Uh, coupled with um, flex time, uh, things like that. Uh, what are your, what, what's your experience in that, and what would you recommend? Um, Jean, you can take this one. And Judy, please chime in on uh, the text. This has been great. Okay, great. Um, there, I guess it, it depends. You know, it's, a, it's. A, I can't give you a, <laughs> a fledgling, a, a great answer on this because it really depends on how much cash you have. Uh, you know, when you're really starting out at a really small stage, it can be really tough to to, to offer a full benefits package to um, to, to new starters. Generally, we I've seen and and the startups over here in the UK offer a, a pretty rounded experience. So they will give you know just general pension and and health and healthcare. Over and above that, if the startup is really small and and can't afford some of the bigger benefits, what they will do is often offer equity. Uh, and this can be really, uh, it can be really appealing to to new hires and and people that are starting out who and are hungry for the the challenges that startup face because really you could go into a startup and if equity yeah. takes off your, your equity could be worth a lot of money one day. Um, so that that I mean that's what my experience has been seeing this and then obviously on the on the, the higher end of things if your company's you know very successful and you've and you've got a lot more mo money in the bank and you can afford more. The flexibility starts to add on to the benefits. What what um, some of the companies that I've worked with try to do is is offer a, almost a menu of benefits. So the, the the candidate can, I mean, the new starter could actually pick from a list of things. So for example, they have there's a list of five things. They are allowed to pick three, and according they can do it according to their lifestyle, which is quite nice and it's flexible and allows the candidate to um, the new starter to choose accordingly. Interesting. And Judy's saying that she sees in New York a group of firms who are trying to track a similar caliber of talent have very similar benefits packages, which I guess makes sense, right? Because when you get into competitive markets, especially somewhat hermetic markets like New York you really have to compete. Uh, and we see that here in LA too, where people really, uh, at a certain level, startups are competing for people. And to get the highest level people, you are gonna have to offer, you're gonna have to know what the other guy across the street is doing, I assume. So here's a, do you, do you I don't know what, this is more of an open question really. How does everyone feel about perks? Do we feel that perks fall under benefits? Yeah, that's a good, uh, interesting question. You know, um, do you kind of in her text kind of breaking those out? I think people, from my experience, they're looking for some, some. you know, you have a freelance level of people, the part-time level of person, then you have the staffer. I would say the staffer here in Santa Monica 
If you're a staffer, you know, you're working full time, you're all in, you're expecting benefits. Perks come and go. You know, we have some per informal perks here uh, in the co-working space we work at, which is flex time, uh, free beer, ha ha ha. Uh, and, you know, the ability to kind of come and go as we please and a kind of an open-ended work environment. I would count those as perks. They're not hardcore things. Like, you know, I don't think I can include them in an offer to a candidate, but they are part of the culture of working here, which I think is this, again, hard to get your arms around, but something that we're going to get into in a moment, this kind of company culture. Uh, Judy's saying when they make an offer to a candidate, we send them the full rundown of benefits, including the perks. And should the person accept in New York higher orientation, they're told of additional perks. So that sounds pretty good. I mean, it all comes down to me to the uh, competitive nature of hiring the best people and what and what you really need to offer. Does that make sense, Dean? Totally, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, let's, uh, 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 this deserves a bit more time to get into this idea of company culture. And I want Natalie to kind of set this one up, if you would, Natalie, and then ask the questions. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, we, we're all familiar with the bigger companies like, you know, Google, Twitter, who encouraged that sort of, um, playful, creative company culture, open, open door policy, idea sharing. And, um, today we see a lot of, you know, millennials, they're, they're coming into the workforce, um, uh, talented people who, um, may not may may want more than just that sort of like nine to five uh, or nine to seven whatever cubicle life um how are startups defining company culture what are what are the trends we're seeing um and then, and that does kind of go back to the perks because it it kind of fills out that um that that culture what what's important uh what a company values and um and then in turn what what the candidates value. So how do you create that? And what, what are some positive company cultures we, we're seeing out there? And um, Dean, if you can, can jump in, and then Judy, please uh, text your, your response too. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let me break that down into two parts. Uh, so the first part, what just to answer your part about what sort of examples are we seeing out there? I'm not sure if you've uh, heard of this SEO company. I've just pasted a a link in into the chat. It's called Moz, uh, and they have a fantastic tool that helps you with SEO. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell it because I, <laughs> I don't work yeah. for them. One of the things I really like is they have a thing called Tag Fee, and it's their uh, their core values, and it has a and has a fantastic page there, really just talking about what they're all about, and it and you know some of the values it has there is transparent and authentic, generous, fun, empathetic, exceptional. Um, and that for me just really stands out as an example of what a company should be doing about their, their, their culture. And, and I also think that, that one of the key areas they have there is this, this term that they, they, they speak about called a core value. And, and really a core value is almost like the ideas or, or, or why the company was felt, founded and what, what makes it tick on a daily basis. Um, you know, Talking about Moz, that's one of those companies. Zappos is another one of those companies, uh, you know, over in the US. Um, and, and they have very key, this almost, this thread threading through their company, which, which is what is their core and what are they trying to achieve? And, and all of that really just stems off how they, how they go about hiring, how they go about, uh, you know, setting up events for their, for their employees and they build things around that. I really like that approach. Yes, uh, Buffer is another company that we use yeah, yeah. that uh, has a really strong company culture. And people, I think, don't think about this enough. Uh, you get it. It's sort of a gut feeling. You come into a company for an interview or you stop by, you meet the founder, or you meet who you're going to be working with, and you get kind of this fuzzy feeling. That's culture. <laughs> and I think it needs to be put front and center Companies I admire, like Moz and like Buffer, and I'm going to be doing this soon myself for Redbuff, to actually codify, to write out the company culture uh, in and put it as part of what the company stands for and what the company is about. We know it with companies like Patagonia and Apple and 
the honest company. You can name a lot of companies that not only the forward-facing stuff that they put out there, their brand, so to speak, is there, but also there's an internal-facing culture that people learn about and know about. So I know we could go on and on here. We're at 1.30. I want to uh, pop the last slide. Uh, Dean, you can, we can keep talking about the culture question in this great team, how to keep them question. And Natalie, if you would set this one up and we'll, we'll kind of open things up for questions here. We can run a little late, 15 minutes or so if there are questions or if we just want to back and forth a little bit. But Natalie, why don't you set this one up? Right, right. Just quickly, you know, we, uh, is there an echo? No, you're okay. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, just, uh, uh, you know, in today's, today's, uh, uh, kind of world we're saying that people might not be not might not uh stay with companies as long as they used to and how um what are the trends with that and what are companies doing to ensure that their key employees their talent their talented employees are staying with them um and you could just talk about that dean and, and give any suggestions and maybe succession plans that sort of thing or definitely so I have uh, a few, I guess, rules that I like to think about when, and you know, these are these are really just based on my prior experience. Uh, some rules that I like to live by when I think of myself as a manager and and the people that report to me and how and how I can ensure that I have happy teams working for me because you know at the end of the day, happy teams make happy products and products that people want to use. So, in terms of some of these rules, some of the rules that I like to think of is. I like to try and schedule regular one-to-one -one meetings um, with the members on, on the teams. Sometimes, depending on the size of your organization, you won't be able to do this with everyone. But if there's, uh, you know, if you're a startup stage, it's a perfect opportunity to, to, you know, every two weeks, every month, have a chat with someone, get some face time, find out what they like, what they don't like. Um, it's really just about uh, a private, you know, trust time. Uh, and, and it helps you, you you tweak things along the way and, and make make changes, which I think makes a big difference to you know retaining these great employees that you've spent all this time hiring. Because the last thing you want to do is lose them at this stage. Um, I also have another rule, which is uh, the "don't be an asshole" rule. <laughs> um, you know, if employees, there's so many great jobs out there nowadays, and the competition for talent is so fierce. If if people aren't being treated well, uh, and this doesn't just mean, you know, perks, I mean, generally just being nice to the people in your office. Uh, it can make such a difference to keeping people and keeping them around. And, and I really live, live by that rule as much as possible. Um, another one of those is trying to avoid burnout. So making sure that where possible, the projects are planned for that you don't expect employees to work all hours of the evening and all hours of the you know the day. Um, really, just planning for your projects. I think and, that's great. Yeah, you know, and Judy, I'm just jumping in. Judy is typing in uh, accessibility to senior management. You know, that kind of open door policy kind of ties into the don't be an asshole uh, rule, but also the kind of keeping the communication channels open, which is what you've been talking about. I think is really valuable. It helps people. And and one more to add on the end to that. So, sorry, Lee. Sure. Is, yeah. Uh, really, just about uh, praising people. Mm. You know, if someone's done a great job. Uh, celebrate the small things. Give them a, give them a chance and, and and congratulate them in front of everyone. It, it makes such a difference. I think. Some of the the best wins that you can do for keeping people actually just really involve the things that are free. You, you know, a simple well done or a, or a or a great job is can go a long way to to making employees happy. That's such a great point. You know, the good job, the simple good job is pretty cool. And the, I want to underscore the thing you brought up a few moments ago about burnout. You know, a lot of times as as managers, as people running companies. We're running this thing 24-7. It's all we think about all the time. And, you know, our spouse, we get our spouses crazy. We get our kids crazy. And if you start getting your employees crazy, it's not so great. Uh, one really has to plan all, if you're a deadline-oriented kind of a business or the clients have expectations, to really plan that out 
and give people time to do a good job because there's nothing more frustrating as an employee of you don't have enough time to do it properly. You know you could do a better job, but they're not giving it for you. You're giving it the time. So that's a tough one. So I, I really appreciate that bringing up the the burnout question and also just the, the do the things that are free that have huge huge value. Great. So um, there's, if there are any questions uh, from anyone, you can chat them in here, and uh, we'll chat we'll chat here. Uh, a bit more if there's anything that we missed. Dean, is there anything that we uh, skated past there that you'd like uh, to delve in a little bit more deeply? Um, I don't think so. I'm just briefly scanning over my list of questions and things to talk about. Uh, but no, no, all sounds good. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, great. Um, I'll talk a little bit more here to see if anyone has some chat questions. And I also, if you don't have an immediate question, and not everybody does, uh, that's okay. You can come back to this big marker platform. There's sort of a Facebook-like interface that you can post a comment to, and we will get back to you and answer it. We're pinged by email or in this platform when you do have a question. So if you want to go a little bit deeper, I realize this is you know, kind of overview, so there's always an opportunity to go deeper. By all means, ask questions. Here's our Q&A slide. Uh, I just wanted to give a special thanks to Dean and Judy for being part of this. Uh, Dean, you'll see at this year's Velocity Conference, Genius Lunch is a monthly series. And if you're here today, you're going to get a notification from us about the next event. We're planning the next one. We're working on one every month. Uh, you can always, like I said, post a comment in the Facebook-like bulletin stream, and we'll answer it. Okay, if we have any questions, we'll hang around for a few moments. Otherwise, we'll probably mute our mics, and I will stop the recording. So thanks, everyone, for coming today. I will post a recording later. You'll get it as being part of this community. It'll also be on the Red Cup Agency website. That's redcupagency.com. Thanks, everyone. I'm Lee Schneider. Communications Director at Red Cup. And Natalie, thanks so much for producing this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Okay, so we'll, uh, I'm going to mute my mic. Others may feel free to do so. And if there are any comments here, we'll hang around for a few moments. And if not, please post them to the bulletin stream. Thanks, everyone.